There is also the superstition of the Ishmaelites which to this day prevails and keeps people in error, being a forerunner of the Antichrist. They are descended from Ishmael, was was born to Abraham of Agar, and for this reason they are called both Agarenes and Ishmaelites. They are also called Saracens, which is derived from Zapakusful, or destitute of Sarah, because of what Agar said to the angel, Sarah hath sent me away destitute. 99 These used to be idol eaters and worship the morning star and Aphrodite, whom in their own language they called her bar, which means great. Well and so down to the time of Heraclius they were very great idolaters. From that time to the present a false prophet named Muhammad has appeared in their midst. This man, after having chanced upon the Old and New Testaments and likewise, it seems, having conversed with an Arian monk, 101 devised his own heresy. Then, having insinuated himself into the good graces of the people by a show of seeming piety, he gave out that a certain book had been sent down to him from heaven. He had set down some ridiculous compositions in this book of his and he gave it to them as an object of veneration. He says that there is one God, creator of all things, who has neither been begotten nor has begotten. 102 He says that the Christ is the word of God and his spirit, but a creature and a servant, and that he was begotten, without seed, of Mary the sister of Moses and Aaron. 103 4, He says, the word and God and the spirit entered into Mary and she brought forth Jesus, who was a prophet and servant of God. And he says that the Jews wanted to crucify him in the viola tion of the law, and that they seized his shadow and crucified this. But the Christ himself was not crucified, he says, nor did he die, for God out of his love for him took him to himself into heaven. 104 And he says this, that when the Christ had ascended into heaven God asked him, See O Jesus, didst thou say, I am the Son of God and God? And Jesus, he says, answered, Be merciful to me, Lord. Thou knowest that I did not say this and that I did not scorn to be thy servant. But sinful men have written that I made this statement, and they have lied about me and have fallen into error. And God answered and said to him, See I know that thou didst not say this word. 105 There are many other extraordinary and quite ridiculous things in this book which he boasts was sent down to him from God. But when we ask, and who is there to testify that God gave him the book? And which of the prophets foretold that such a prophet would rise up? S. They are at a loss. And we remark that Moses received the law on Mount Sinai, with God appearing in the sight of all the people in cloud, and fire, and darkness, and storm. And we say that all the prophets from Moses on down foretold the coming of Christ and how Christ God, and incarnate Son of God, was to come and to be crucified and die and rise again and how he was to be the judge of the living and dead. Then, when we say, see how is it that this prophet of yours did not come in the same way, with others bearing witness to him? And how is it that God did not in your presence present this man with the book to which you refer, even as he gave the law to Moses, with the people looking on and the mountain smoking, so that you, too, might have certainty? 3 They answer that God does as he pleases. This slash we say, we know, but we are asking how the book came down to your prophet. 3 Then they reply that the book came down to him while he was asleep. Then we jokingly say to them that, as long as he received the book in his sleep and did not actually sense the operation, then the popular adage applies to him, which runs, you're spinning me dreams, 106 When we ask again, how is it that when he enjoined us in this book of yours not to do anything or receive anything without witnesses, you did not ask him, First do you show us by witnesses that you are a prophet and that you have come from God, and show us just what scriptures there are that testify about you they are ashamed and remain silent. Then we continue, although you may not marry a wife without witnesses, or buy, or acquire property, although you neither receive an ass nor possess a beast of burden unwitnessed, and although you do possess both wives and property and asses and so on through witnesses, yet it is only your faith and your scriptures that you hold unsubstantiated by witnesses. For he who handed this down to you has no warranty from any source, nor is there any one known who testified about him before he came. On the contrary, he received it while he was asleep. Moreover, they call us heteriasts, or associators, because, they say, we introduce an associate with God by declaring Christ to the Son of God and God. We say to them in rejoinder, the prophets and the scriptures have delivered this to us, and you, as you persistently maintain, accept the prophets. So, if we wrongly declare Christ to be the Son of God, it is they who taught this and handed it on to us. 
but some of them say that it is by misinterpretation that we have represented the prophets as saying such things, while others say that the Hebrews hated us and deceived us by writing in the name of the prophets so that we might be lost. And again we say to them, as long as you say that Christ is the word of God and Spirit, why do you accuse us of being heteriasts? For the word, and the Spirit, is inseparable from that in which it naturally has existence. Therefore, if the word of God is in God, then it is obvious that he is God. If, however, he is outside of God, then, according to you, God is without word and without spirit. Consequently, by avoiding the introduction of an associate with God you have mutilated him. It would be far better for you to say that he has an associate than to mutilate him, as if you were dealing with a stone or a piece of wood or some other inanimate object. Thus, you speak untruly when you call us heteriasts, we retort by calling you mutilators of God. They furthermore accuse us of being idolaters, because we venerate the cross, which they abominate. And we answer them, How is it, then, that you rub yourselves against a stone in your Kaaba 107 and kiss and embrace it? Then some of them say that Abraham had relations with Agar upon it, but others say that he tied the camel to it, when he was joined to sacrifice Isaac. And we answer them, since scripture says that the mountain was wooded and had trees from which Abraham cut wood for the holocaust and laid it upon Isaac, 108 and then he left the asses behind with the two young men, why talk nonsense? For in that place neither is it thick with trees nor is there passage for asses. And they are embarrassed, but they still assert that the stone is Abraham's. Then we say, let it be Abraham's, as you so foolishly say. Then, just because Abraham had relations with a woman on it or tied a camel to it, you are not ashamed to kiss it, yet you blame us for venerating the cross of Christ by which the power of the demons and the deceit of the devil was destroyed. This stone that they talk about is a head of that Aphrodite whom they used to worship and whom they called her bar. Even to the present day, traces of the carving are visible on it to careful observers. As has been related, this Muhammad wrote many ridiculous books, to each one of which he set a title. For example, there is the book on woman in which he plainly makes legal provision for taking four wives and, if it be possible, a thousand concubines as many as one can maintain, besides the four wives. He also made it legal to put away whichever wife one might wish, and, should one so wish, to take to oneself another in the same way. Muhammad had a friend named Zaid. This man had a beautiful wife with whom Muhammad fell in love. Once, when they were sitting together, Mohammed said, Oh, by the way, God has commanded me to take your wife. Five the other answered, See you are an apostle. Do as God has told you and take my wife. Rather to tell the story over from the beginning he said to him, God has given me the command that you put away your wife. And he put her away. Then several days later, now, he said, God has commanded me to take her. Then, after he had taken her and committed adultery with her, he made this law, Let him, who will put away his wife. And if, after having put her away, he should return to her, let another marry her. For it is not lawful to take her unless she have been married by another. Furthermore, if a brother puts away his wife, let his brother marry her, should he so wish. In the same book he gives such precepts as this, Work the land which God hath given thee and beautify it. And do this, and do it in such a manner 3111 not to repeat all the obscene things that he did. Then there is the book of the camel of God. 112 About this camel he says that there was a camel from God and that she drank the whole river and could not pass through two mountains, because there was not room enough. There were people in that place, he says, and they used to drink the water on one day, while the camel would drink it on the next. Moreover, by drinking the water she furnished them with nourishment, because she supplied them with milk instead of water. Then, because these men were evil, they rose up, he says, and killed the camel. However, she had an offspring, a little camel, which, he says, when the mother had been done away with, called upon God and God took it to himself. Then we say to them, Where did that camel come from? Three and they say that it was from God. Then we say, Was there another camel coupled with this one? And they say, See number three then how slash we say, Was it begotten? For we see that your camel is without father and without mother and without genealogy, and that the one that begot it suffered evil neither is it evident who bred her. And also, this little camel was taken up. So why did not your prophet, with whom, according to what you say, God spoke, find out about the camel where it grazed, and who got milk by milking it? Or did she possibly, like her mother, meet with evil people and get destroyed? 
or did she enter into paradise before you, so that you might have the river of milk that you so foolishly talk about? For you say that you have three rivers flowing in paradise one of water, one of wine, and one of milk. If your forerunner the camel is outside of paradise, it is obvious that she has dried up from hunger and thirst, or that others have the benefit of her milk and so your prophet is boasting idly of having conversed with God, because God did not reveal to him the mystery of the camel. But if she is in paradise, she is drinking water still, and you for lack of water will dry up in the midst of the paradise of delight. And if, there being no water, because the camel will have drunk it all up, you thirst for wine from the river of wine that is flowing by, you will become intoxicated from drinking pure wine and collapse under the influence of the strong drink and fall asleep. Then, suffering from a heavy head, after sleeping and being sick from the wine, you will miss the pleasures of paradise. How, then, did it not enter into the mind of your prophet that this might happen to you in the paradise of delight? He never had any idea of what the camel is leading to now, yet you did not even ask him, when he held forth to you with his dreams on the subject of the three rivers. We plainly assure you that this wonderful camel of yours has preceded you into the souls of asses, where you, too, like beasts are destined to go. And there there is the exterior darkness and everlasting punishment, roaring fire, sleepless worms, and hellish demons. 9. Again, in the book of the table, Muhammad says that the Christ asked God for a table, and that it was given him. For God, he says, said to him, I have given to thee and thine an incorruptible table. 3113. And again, in the book of the heifer, 11 he says some other stupid and ridiculous things, which, because of their great number, I think must be passed over. He made it a law that they be circumcised, and the women, too, and he ordered them not to keep the Sabbath and not to be baptized. And, while he ordered them to eat some of the things forbidden by the law, he ordered them to abstain from others. He furthermore absolutely forbade the drinking of wine. Dialogue between a Christian and a Saracen A Christian was asked by a Saracen, Whom do you say is the cause of good and evil? The Christian replied, We say that no one but God is the cause of all good, but not evil. Saracen Then whom do you say is the cause of evil? Christian The devil, who is such by his own decision, and also we men. Saracen By virtue of what? Christian By virtue of our free will. Saracen. What? You mean to say you have free will and can do anything you wish? Christian. I was created by God with a will that is free. I may act well or badly, that is, I may do good or evil, if I do evil, I am punished by the law of God, but if I do good I do not fear the law, but I am rewarded and obtain mercy from God. Adam, the first man, was likewise created by God with free will, but the devil deceived him and he sinned, so God cast him down from his proper status. But perhaps you will ask, in an effort to thwart me, what are the goods and evils of which you speak? The goods are the glorification of God, prayer, almsgiving, and the like, and the evils are fornication, robbery, murder, and the like. Now if you want to make God the cause of evil as well as good, he appears, in your view, unjust, which he is not. For if God enjoined the fornicator to fornicate, the robber to rob, and the murderer to murder, as you say, then they deserve a reward, for they have done the will of God, and your lawgivers seem to be liars and your books false when they command us to whip the fornicator and robber and kill the murderer. Then the Saracen asked, Do you say that a Christian who does the will of God is good or evil? But the Christian, knowing his craftiness, replied, I know what you are getting at. Saracen. Then you may tell it to me. Christian. You want to ask me, did Christ suffer by his will or not? And if I answer you, he suffered by his will, you will reply, ye off. Then honor the Jews, for they did the will of your God. Saracen. Yes, that is most assuredly what I wanted to ask you, and if you have anything to say on this matter I should like to hear it. Christian. You use the word will, I would be inclined to say permission, subsistence, and forbearance. Saracen. How could you demonstrate this? Christian. If you or I are sitting or standing, can either of us rise or be moved without the power and will of God? Saracen. By no means. Christian. And when God said, Thou shalt not rob, fornicate, or murder, he clearly did not want us to rob, fornicate, or murder? 
Saracen. Clearly not, for if he had wanted that, he certainly would not have said, Thou shalt not rob, fornicate, or murder. Christane. Glory be to God, for then you agree with me and are saying precisely what I want to say. We are in accord that none of us can rise or be moved without God, and that God does not want us to rob, fornicate, or murder. Therefore if I should rise up and go and rob or fornicate or murder, what do you call that? Is it God's will, or would permission, subsistence, and forbearance be better words? The truth of the matter is that God, although he could have intervened, agreed to the crucifixion, and used it, by permitting it, against sin. But when he wishes to cause repentance, he punishes, he did this against the Jews also, for after a little while he aroused Titus, Vespasian, and the Greeks against them, and put down their insolence. Saracen. What do you call Christ? Christian. He is called the Word of God and many other things in our scripture. What does your scripture call him? Saracen. The Spirit and Word of God. Christian. Does your scripture consider that the Word of God was created or uncreated? Saracen. It was uncreated. Christian. But whatever is not created but uncreated is God. And if you were to answer me, created, I should ask you further, then who created the Word and Spirit of God? Saracen. What if I should answer that God himself created them? Christian. Then you would be forced to say that before God created his Spirit and Word he had neither the Spirit nor the Word. I say that I believe in only one Word of God which is uncreated, namely Christ, but of course I do not mean the Scripture itself when I say the Word of God here. Saracen. I would like to know how you can say that God came down into the womb of a woman. Christian. Very well. Let us make use of your scripture as well as mine. Your scripture says that God cleansed Mary beforehand above all womankind, and that the Spirit and Word of God came down to her. And my Gospel says, The Holy Spirit will come down upon thee and the power of the Most High will overshadow thee. Thus it seems that the two have one and the same meaning. But it should be noted that because of the state of our intellects the scripture uses the words come down upon tropologically. Saracen. What is the meaning of tropologically? Christian. Tropologically means figuratively, or by analogy. Saracen. If Christ was God, how is it that he ate and drank and slept and was crucified and died, and all the rest? Christian. Because the word of God, who created all things, as both my scripture and yours attest, created him from the flesh of the Holy Virgin, a perfect man, endowed with life and intellect. He ate, drank, and slept. But the word of God itself did not eat, drink, or sleep, nor was it crucified, nor did it die, but it was the flesh which Christ took on from the Holy Virgin that was crucified. Christ had a dual nature united in one by the hypostatic union, a fourth person was not added to the Trinity after the ineffable union of the Incarnation. Saracen. Suppose I were wounded in a part of my flesh, and the wounded flesh contracted, leaving a scar, and in the scar an infection developed, who would have created that? Christian. All creatures were created during the first week. God created man also during these days, and ordered him to propagate and fill the earth. However, after the original sin, the earth was condemned to bring forth thorns and thistles, then also our flesh was condemned, and it brings forth lice and worms to this day. Saracen. To turn to another matter, who is the greater among you, he who sanctifies or he who is sanctified? But the Christian, knowing his hostile questioning, replied, I understand what it is you want to know. Saracen. Well, if you do, answer me. Christane. If I say to you, he who sanctifies is greater than he who is sanctified, you will immediately respond, be off. Then worship John the Baptist, who certainly baptized and sanctified your Christ. Saracen. That is obviously what I would have said to you. The Christian answered with an allegory. Suppose you go out with your slave to the bath to wash, and he washes and cleans you, whom would you say is the greater, that poor and penniless slave of yours or you yourself, whom he has washed? Saracen. I would say that I myself, who own, am greater than he whom I own. Christian. I give thanks to God for your reply. You should know, then, that John the Baptist, ministering to Christ as a slave and servant in the holy baptism in the Jordan in which my Saviour was baptized, broke the heads of those dragons and bad demons who were lying in the caves there. At this the Saracen marveled greatly, and, having nothing to answer the Christian, went away and debated with him no further. St. John Damascene, 
translated by J. Kritzek and Anne Fremantle, A Treasury of Early Christianity, Mentor Books, 1953.